Okay, so this is going to be a somewhat brief yet lengthy uh, lecture explanation on the legislative process, which I'm going to break down for you guys in three steps. So the first one deals with committee work. Now, before I get right into what committees are about, realize, again, anyone can suggest an idea for a law, but only a member of Congress can take a proposed law to the House or to the Senate. So just think about any time uh, a congressperson introduces a bill as like a statement of his or her beliefs. This is his or her way of saying, this is what's important to me. This is what's important to my constituents. Thus, I'm putting this piece of legislation out there with my name on it um, because I want to fight for this goal or because uh, I want to bring jobs back home to my community, or I want to represent my community's values in national politics, any number of these things. But once a bill is introduced, uh, very simply, it's assigned a number that begins with an HR for the House of Representatives or an S for the Senate. So after a bill is introduced, very simple there, this is where we'll get into committee work. It is referred to the appropriate standing committee. So you can see all the different standing committees in Congress that we have on the right. So they're also called full committees or permanent committees. But uh, this will, excuse me, a bill get referred by the Speaker of the House. So this is where we see the Speaker's power deciding where a bill goes and to which committee. There's a lot to that. Or the Senate's presiding officer. So this is pretty simple here. So let's say we have a congressman from Iowa who's introducing a bill on farming. And I'm the Speaker of the House and I have to decide, okay, which committee does it make sense to send this bill on farming to? Well, I could probably send it to the Agricultural Committee. And you can see we have one in the House and one in the Senate. So sometimes bills could be sent to a number of different committees. And this is where things can really get uh, complicated. I'm going to say real broad here, but basically, um, sometimes you know those in charge will send a bill to a committee that they know it will die in. Uh, but I'm not going to get into all that now. But usually, a bill sent to the committee, the the full committee, the standing committee that has jurisdiction or whatever you want to call it over that topic there. So again, if this is a bill dealing with foreign affairs, I drop down to number nine. Uh, we're going to send this, or number 10 on the Senate, we're going to send it to the Committee on Foreign Affairs or Foreign Relations. So it's just kind of simple context there. Now, if you want to click on this video, uh, this will take you, uh, if you just don't want to hear me talk about it, basically someone else, say a little bit more about what goes on these congressional committees. But let me point out some things you have here. Because the basic thing here, if you notice, whether a bill's starting in the Senate, bill gets its number, same as the House. It's assigned to the appropriate standing committee. Okay, so here's where I'll stop for a second. Now, once a bill's in the committee's hands, now a new set of people basically take over. So just like we have a chairperson uh, for our committees, so too does every single committee in Congress. So the chairperson is, um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's voting that's done on it and all this different stuff. I'm not gonna get into that. But just know the majority party in each house selects uh, ultimately who the chairperson will be on the different committees. So in the House right now, uh, we have 20 committees. Uh, the House of Representatives is controlled by the Democrats. So every single chairperson is a Democrat. And then in the Senate, we have 16 committees. The Senate is controlled by Republicans. So every single uh, committee in the Senate is headed by a Republican chairperson. So there's that. They have a ton of power, okay? A lot of power over their committees. And basically what they can do is to decide whether or not to take up discussion on a bill or just to kind of kill it, to, to just let it sit by the wayside and never ever touch it ever again. And uh, most bills die in committee. So remember there's 10,000 bills that are introduced every two years roughly. Uh, we're not passing very many bills. So again, committees is where bills come to die. But for simple things, just continuing, continuing on what we have uh, going on here. 
So I just got a notification and I want to silence my phone. So as you can see here, after a bill goes to uh, a committee, it is then assigned to a subcommittee. So hopefully just how we've done committees uh, in class makes sense. So this is where they will hold hearings on a bill. They'll call in experts. Uh, they will call in, um, I'll go to the next one right here. You know, they'll, if you go back in time, uh, you think about our topic on lobbyists. And we talked about this cartoon, the Congressional Super Committee to blah, 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 all this stuff. Right. This is where you see the main job of lobbyists come into play. So uh, when subcommittees are holding their hearings or when committees are holding their hearings, uh, they're going to call in experts. And a lot of times those experts will be lobbyists. So this is where we see the, the real big impact of um, <clears throat> the big money that we see in politics really swaying the decision making of uh, our representatives in Congress. So like this is where you could take all that stuff on special interest groups and lobbyists and just kind of drop it right into this point on uh, subcommittees. But I mean, what they basically do here is they study the heck out of a bill. Um, they try and figure out the pros and cons of a bill. They get as much information on the bill as they can. They get as many opposing perspectives on the bill. So if you want to kind of get a sense of what uh, a committee hearing looks like, I, I linked in a two hour video on the COVID-19 response and preparedness hearing that was done. Uh, if you have two hours to watch this and enjoy this, you want to get into politics. If you have no interest in watching this, I understand why. And then just if you want a little bit more on congressional committees, just another one here. There's just a, another um, crash course video on this. But if you walk away saying, OK, in committees is where the vast majority of work in Congress gets done. This is where I'm going to go back to this slide. They will send a bill to a specific subcommittee where they'll hold hearings. They'll meet with lobbyists. They'll meet with uh, government experts. They'll meet with people from academia who are experts, you know, so university professors. They're going to, I'm dropping down one, mark up that bill in a subcommittee. So it's kind of like a revision process. You know, bill's introduced to the committee. It's given to the subcommittee. They read it over. They think about it. They get all their expert hearings. They get all that new information. Then they remodify the bill, basically. They rewrite it. Or they make additions or updates or they pull stuff out. You know, just, again, uh, imagine if you're writing a paper. You're just going through that writing process. And then after the subcommittee's done, they send it back to the full committee. So that is exactly the same in the Senate as in the House. Okay, same thing. We're going through this full markup. Okay, it's my responsibility in the Appropriation Committee or the Rules Committee or the Small Business Committee to basically do all the work on this bill. So when we put it on the calendar, um, it's a finished product, more or less. And we're just going to get to the point of debate on it. So when we get to this last part on full committee markup, so imagine if you went from a small group of people to a larger group of people in this, they'll make their final decision and they'll basically decide whether or not they like the bill or not at this point. So it's called, do they vote favorably on it? Uh, do they recommend the bill for approval? Things like that. So basically, should we put the bill on the calendar? And you can see that is the same for both the House and the Senate. There's a slight difference with this Rules Committee, which I'll get to momentarily. So next, let's say that both, you know, the committee, uh, the subcommittee, the vote favorably on this bill, they decide to put it on the, on the calendar. Then it goes to debate. But there's two different ways of debate, and this goes back to the differences between the House and the Senate. So I'm going to start first with floor debate in the House of Representatives. And you can see I threw some key terms up on here. So there's 435 members in the House. Power is centralized in leadership, specifically the Speaker of the House. So that means they have different rules for debate. So the main thing you want to look at here is they have what's called closed debate or restricted debate. And all debate in the House of Representatives is set by the Rules Committee. 
So this is an additional committee. You can see it's right here uh, on a legislative process. But at the same time, there is no rules committee in the Senate, which I'll get to momentarily. Now, if you want this video right here, it's just a couple minutes kind of showing you how a rules committee works uh, and what they do. But I'll just give you a couple key things on this. So basically the rules committee, they decide the procedures under which a bill will be debated upon on the floor. And if they can't come to an agreement on rules, the bill dies right there. So in other words, a bill could get a number, be assigned to a committee, be assigned to a subcommittee, go through the whole hearings process, get completely marked up, sent back to the full committee. They mark it up further, they vote favorably on it, they send it to the rules committee. The rules committee can't decide on rules, bill dies. So the rules committee's really, really powerful, like uber powerful. So here's a couple quotes on it. Uh, it's just referred to as a, a tool of leadership, meaning the rules committee is filled with supporters of the Speaker of the House. And to speak in the broadest of terms, the Speaker of the House wants to dictate or control discussion on the floor because he or she wants to basically do everything in his or her power to make sure that the bill gets through debate uh, in a manner that they want to be able to control. So another quote on this is the majority leader's traffic manager. So the key thing about this is in the rules committee, the members who sit on it are heavily stacked in favor of the majority party. And a lot of those people have been basically selected by the Speaker of the House. So this is where we see, like, in the House of Representatives, very simple, guys. The majority party is dominant. And that's purposely set up that way. Dominant, okay? And that's why uh, Nancy Pelosi wants to do everything she can to keep her hands on uh, the House because of the influence that one position has. So here's what those main responsibilities are in the Rules Committee. Uh, they set and control the process by which legislation is debated on the floor. So real simple, they'll decide uh, how long you can talk for on a bill. So uh, they'll decide whether or not conversation must be germane to the bill. So what that means is if the bill uh, focuses on agriculture, I can't talk about like the concert I went to last week. All conversation has to be on the bill itself, related to the bill. Because the goal is to ensure that debate runs smoothly um, <clears throat> as possible. Cause like how else would you have 435 people able to talk? So again, they're gonna set rules for debate. They're gonna set how long you can talk for. It's usually a couple minutes on a bill. Uh, and there's other things to it. I'm just not going to get into all that. But just know that Rules Committee sets the rules for debate. If a bill doesn't get passed, or excuse me, if, a, if, if rules can't be decided upon within uh, the Rules Committee, it often dies. And because they decide a number of factors, again, the main one I'll point out is how long somebody can talk on a bill and whether or not discussion must be germane to the bill or not. We have closed debate. We have restricted debate. It can't go on forever because there were rules set up first. Now, if uh, rules committee comes up with uh, their rules, the bill's put on the calendar. So I'm a little out of order here. And if you click on this link, it'll actually take you to the legislative calendar if you care to see that. Um, and this is where, again, the Speaker of the House comes into play because he or she gets to decide if a bill comes off of the calendar or not and then goes on to the floor for debate. So there's some ways around that. You don't need to worry about that. It's called a discharge petition. Um, but uh, ultimately, the Speaker of the House can kind of dictate what gets onto the floor. So that's it for the House. Now, in the Senate, it is very very different. Think about it this way, okay? All 100 members in all these 50 states have an incredible amount of sway over the legislative process. So in other words, they have open debate. Okay, so um, 
conceivably, because this is meant to be the more collegial, communicative, collaborative uh, house, they could talk forever on a bill um, because there's no set rules for how long a bill actually takes. So there's this thing called unanimous consent. That's how most bills move through the Senate, uh, where they'll actually set rules beforehand. They'll say, okay, unanimous consent. We'll uh, talk about this for X number of time, and then we'll move on. You don't need to worry about all that. We're just going to look at this in really big, broad terms. And the basic idea is that like members of Congress have so much power, or excuse me, members of the Senate have so much power over the legislative process. So with their being open debate, they have different tricks that they can use. Um, so the one I'll talk about is this idea called a filibuster. And the basic idea is it is talking a bill to death. Now, one of the most famous examples of a filibuster as of late uh, was this guy right here. Senator Ted Cruz ran for the presidency uh, in 2016. Obviously lost in the primaries to uh, President Trump. Uh, he came in second, though Ted Cruz did. And he made his name filibustering on uh, the Affordable Care Act. And if you want to kind of get a sense of what a filibuster is, I got a YouTube video on it here if you want to see it a little bit more in depth than what I'm about to explain or just watching Ted Cruz filibuster. But realize this is a tool. It's a tool used by the minority party to stop passage of a bill. So talk forever. Uh, for instance, to give you a point of historical context, when our country was going through the civil rights movement and we were trying to pass the Civil Rights Act, um, the Southern Democrats filibustered the Civil Rights Act for like some 50 odd days. And the idea behind a filibuster is basically you have to stand up on uh, the floor. Uh, you're not allowed to give way. You can't. You can't step away to go get a snack, to eat lunch, to to use a bathroom break, and you have to talk nonstop. Uh, this is where we have heard Ted Cruz talking about green eggs and ham. Uh, we've had people read from the phone book, if you even know what a phone book is, um, and this is where. I'm thinking about in the Civil Rights Act where, like, it's not just one person's talking for 50 some odd days, but, you know, I could cede the floor, give the floor to another member, and uh, I could have a group of 10 people, and we filibuster for 100 straight days, something like that, if we wanted, as long as we just don't give up the floor. So this is this idea of, you know, I'm in the minority party, but I still have power because everybody in Congress in the Senate has a lot of power and I want to talk a bill to death so it never, ever, ever gets to a vote. No, that's the strategy I'll use. And in today's politics, the threat of a filibuster is usually enough to kill a bill. Now, a filibuster can be broken and this it is broken by this thing called cloture. Now, all uh, debate in the Senate is ended by a cloture. So it's where a minimum of 60 members are needed to basically say, look, we're, we're all agreeing to end debate. So if you had a filibuster going on for 20 days and um, you could only get 55 people to vote for cloture, that debate's not going to end. But that's the main tool that is used uh by members in the Senate to talk a bill to death. And again, it's reflective of the fact that it's open debate on the floor and there's really no real rules in the Senate because each individual Senator is vested with so much power, so much influence. Uh, so it's meant to be more collegial, more communicative. And again, that's reflective in the fact that there's not a lot of rules on debate in the Senate. And I've realized I never updated this the entire time. So that's the Senate now. All right. And then finally, you go to voting on a bill. Now, a couple things. Um, when you get to this point, and this is the pretty simplistic part here, easiest of it all. In the House of Representatives, you need what is known as a quorum, which is basically half of all members of the House must be present. 
So this is where the whips come into play. They got to make sure people show up to vote, for instance, and they got to get people there because not everybody votes all the time. So in the House, you need a quorum. And in the Senate, that's not the case. But there's a lot of different ways to vote. There's these things called voice votes and division votes and roll call votes. So there's all these little minor things. I'm not worried about any of that. What you do need to know about is to pass a bill in the House, in the Senate, you need a simple majority, 51 out of 100 in the Senate or whatever half would be uh, of 435. Um, I'm not doing that math in my head right now, though it's simple. So just 51%. Now, if you go back to this point that I made up here, uh, the president signs one bill, it must be exactly the same. So that's where this conference committee comes in. And here's a little video on it, going back to our government shutdown from a year ago, uh, kind of explaining how a conference committee kind of works a little bit here, talking about some of the differences they need to work out. But let's just say that, and I'm gonna draw for you here, uh, a bill goes all the way here, okay? And we get bill version A, and then a bill goes through all this here, and we get bill, bill version B, and let's say this is uh, dealing something with money, so it's the same bill. I'm a fantastic artist. Uh, and only one bill can go here. We can't send version A, we can't send version B, we have to send the same thing. Well, that's when a bill goes to conference committee. And a conference committee is made up of members of the Senate. It is made up of members of the House. And basically what they do is they work in a conference, or excuse me, they work in this committee to be able to work out differences. So uh, what are the discrepancies in version A versus B? What are the differences we have? How do we uh, resolve those differences? So let's say they can't resolve those differences. The bill dies. Let's say they can resolve the differences. Then basically uh, both houses vote on it again and then it gets sent to the president. So that's just one extra step. So let's say that uh, a bill were to move through here just one more time and we get version A of the bill and a bill moves through here and we get version A of the bill. So in other words, we have the same exact bill and there is no conference committee. It's just when there's differences between the bills. But anyway, so let's say a bill goes to the president. He has one of two options. He can either one, veto a bill, which in essence is his way of saying no. So checks and balances. And in today's society, uh, our politics, pretty much a presidential veto is enough to kill a bill right off the bat. Uh, and that's something we see regularly uh, when that threat is made if the president doesn't like it. Excuse me. Uh, and then two, the president can sign it. So here's where a couple things go on. Let's say a president vetoes it. Well, it gets sent back to the House and the Senate where they look to potentially override the president's vote, or excuse me, the president's veto. Now, as I said before, that only happens 4% of the time historically. So it's not very often. And that's because you need a supermajority vote in both houses, both the Senate and in the House to be able to override a bill. And you need a two thirds majority. So when you figure that our Congress does a pretty poor job of passing legislation and they only need a simple majority, that helps to explain why this does not happen much at all. Um, and that's really a tough situation because that's one of the key things that we need Congress to do to hold the president accountable is to override his vetoes, but Congress doesn't get along as we've talked about a lot. Um, but if they were to override his veto with a supermajority, that bill would officially become law. So that is that. Uh, I don't know how long I was just talking for, but if you listen to this, um, one, again, you're the greatest student ever, or two, you need hobbies. And apparently listening to me talk is hobby is your hobby and I can't get off that. Okay, here we go. Don't mind that little part there. So if you listen through all this, do the Kahoot. It's 12 questions. How does a bill become a law? You can see the link, the pin right there. You can use your notes. You can go back to the slides. But before you take the quiz, basically, 
Uh, this will be a little bit of a test for you to see if you understood what I just rambled on. So do the coop and thank you for listening.